Funding for the Pause for Pride series in this production of Folks was provided by a grant from the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities. Coming up on today's edition of Folks, a look at the uniquely African-American tradition of gospel music. Dr. Joyce Jackson, an ethnomusicologist at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge, guides us through a moving experience of gospel music, all on today's edition of Folks. Hello everyone and welcome to Folks. I'm Sonia Massingale. Today's program begins our salute to Black History Month. Though we believe black history should be celebrated every day and we try to do that on Folks, Black History Month is the time when we go that extra mile. If you've been keeping up with Folks over the years, you'll recognize the title of our Black History Month series, Pause for Pride. Today marks the first installment of this year's offering. Ethnomusicology is a relatively new word its definition, according to the esteemed Webster's New World Dictionary, is the study of the music of a particular region and its social cultural implications, especially of music outside the European art tradition. We find through our exploration of today's subject that the study of gospel music in particular tells us some important things about the history of just about all American music. Whether you like gospel or not is really not important. That you understand it and its African origins, however, just may give some insight into how it evolved into its present day form and its cultural impact on America and indeed upon the world at large. Today you'll meet Dr. Joyce Jackson, an ethnomusicologist at Louisiana State University. Among other things, she tells us that gospel music still retains many similarities to the traditions of West Africa, the regions where many African Americans trace their ancestry. Here's today's installment of our Pause for Pride. I'm so grateful. Truly, truly, truly grateful. There is something special about a gospel song. Whatever your religion, the emotions encountered in gospel music make themselves felt. That emotionalism is only a small dimension of gospel music, an African-American art form which reveals connecting links to its African roots. There are several ways that it reveals this link, and we can look at it in the musical aspects, but um, there are also other aspects like um, the visual aspects uh, emotionalism, body movement, and um, um, the whole philosophy behind it. The term gospel music derives from the word of the Bible. It promotes the Christian vision of deliverance from spiritual and social restrictions. Gospel music is said to be a religious expression of life and death, invariably made under extreme circumstances. Altogether more extreme than other music in its depths and heights, we find that contrast play an important role in gospel and West African music. In other aspects, like contrast as far as colors are concerned, that's important too. In African, in African society, you see the bright colors and the ornaments, the jewelry, and um, uh, contrasting colors. Well, you can see this with gospel music too, with the choirs and their, the robes that they wear. You usually have them with the coordinating colors and 
the uh, director may wear something just a bit different than the other uh, members of the choir. And if it's not a choir, if it's uh, like a small group, a quartet or a, or a small ensemble, they may have on all suits or all long gowns or dresses that are the same color or coordinating colors. So color is very important in the black aesthetic. And you know, it started again with Africa. Um, now, so the body movement. You have uh, in Africa dances that go along with certain religious rituals. And you have the same thing where, you know, we have the shout, of course, in, in the trance that goes along with gospel music and um, any type of um, worship services in the black church, in the black folk church, shall I say. Um, now, the body movement is important because a lot of singers said, you know, that they might not be able to reach a certain note if they can't move their body in a certain way. to the 1930s or so, gospel was for the most part improvised and spontaneous, a practice that still exists in the so-called black folk church. When I say the black folk church, I mean a, a church that um, has quite a bit of emotionalism. Um, the minister doesn't read from a manuscript, but he actually uh, composes the sermon as he goes on. Sure, he may have an outline to go by, uh, but it's um, composed spontaneously for the most part. And also the music is improvised, it's gospel music usually, or spirituals, or um, you know, some type of praise songs. And it's, it's improvised music. Um, they usually let Inhibitions go in a black folk church. It's very emotional, and, and people shout. Uh, they're uh, possessed or, or you know, go into trance. Uh, so the inhibitions just just leave them. You know, they do whatever they feel is necessary. You know, if, if the spirit hits them.
Gospel music is not considered an entertainment art form. Through the ages, it has served as a reflection of the times, a sort of historical register. Um, I look at gospel music as a reflection of the times in, um, in black history. And uh, you can look at the music, look at gospel music, and trace black history through the line of the music, through the development of the music. And um, you can start back in the beginning, in the 20s, when Thomas Dorsey was, uh, we look at him as the father of gospel music, uh, but he was the first one to really popularize gospel music. And uh, although <clears throat> Charles Tinley was the first one to write gospel, he's the first black composer to write gospel music, but it was back in the 1900s, from about 1900 to 1906. Thomas Dorsey started writing in, in the late 20s, and he wrote as, um, a means of commentating on the conditions of the time. And you know, this was the beginning of the Depression era. So he felt that people needed good news, you know, because the, all you heard during the Depression time was bad news. Gospel music is reputed to have a somewhat ambivalent nature. During the early part of the 20th century until now, many performers moved back and forth between singing the sanctified gospel and the unrestrained popular music of the time. Some of the gospel musicians came out of the secular side. As a matter of fact, Thomas Dorsey was uh, uh, the uh, pianist for Ma Rainey, who was a classic blues singer during the time in the 20s. And Thomas Dorsey played for her quite some time before he went over to, to composing and playing gospel music. So you see, you have that direct relationship right there. And a lot of people say, well, you know, some gospel music sounds so much like the secular music, black secular music, soul music and rhythm and blues. But some of the, the, the best known gospel singers, the early ones, had that blues influence, like, like Thomas Dorsey. And uh, you have even some people that we know today, like Linda Hopkins from New Orleans, for instance. She started singing gospel, then she went over and started singing secular music, and now she's gone back to singing gospel. So eventually, a lot of them come back to the gospel feel. You have people like Sam Cooke. Sam Cooke was a gospel singer. He got his start in the church and singing with quartets, you know, Sam Cooke and the, the Soul Stirrers. And then, um, you know, he went over into secular music. And then you had whole groups going over to secular music. We had one group in New Orleans, one quartet called um, the Soproco Singers. And they would sing gospel on one hand and then go over and sing secular music. They would sing the blues and then they would change the name. They would call themselves the Larks. But it was the same group, you know, they would sing whatever was necessary at the time. So this happened, you had that sacred secular dichotomy that happened all the way through the history and development of the music. It is difficult, if not impossible, to listen to gospel and remain detached from it. But listening to it is often not enough to understand it. We have much to gain by studying gospel and its uniquely African-American roots. It's very important to understand because for one thing, during Black History Month, we do a lot of programs on black culture, but you know, we really should study it throughout the whole year. But black culture is, you know, if you can understand your culture, especially if you're a black person, where you can, you can understand where you came from, where you can get a better direction of where to go, I feel. And, um, and if other people can understand the culture, you know, it can bring about quite a bit of unity that, you know, in a lot of respects we don't have in certain areas of, of society today. And I feel that in studying the music, just like in studying the culture and studying the history, the art, the visual arts, dance, the whole thing, you can learn a lot about the people.
if you can deal with people as a whole and know more about you know where they came from and what they're about I think you know it just brings about more unity in the society as a whole if you would like to learn more about gospel music its african-american roots and its impact on american music as a whole you might want to read the following books the gospel sound good news and bad times by anthony heilbert published by limelight editions the new groove gospel blues and jazz by oliver harrison and bolcom published by w w norton and company and black gospel an illustrated history of the gospel sound by viv broughton publisher blandford press We'd like to end our program today with the rousing sounds of the choir of the True Light Baptist Church. See you next week.
funding for the Pause for Pride series in this production of Folks was provided by a grant from the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities.